Hi, I'm Shannon Tal, and I'm about to be on the online prosperity show where me and Prosper talk all things usability, accessibility across websites and museums. Hey there, online prosperity show of viewers. Welcome back to another electrifying episode where we dive deep into the realms of success and innovation. I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga. And today we've got a guest who is about to blow your mind in the most creative way possible. Now, Shannon, how are you doing today? I'm really good. I'm very excited to be here. Absolutely. For those that don't know Shannon, well, I don't know what rock you've been hiding underneath. Well, this episode is going to help you climb out of that rock and get ready to buckle up because I think this promises to be one of the most exhilarating episodes we've had in a while. And we're going to be bringing you insights, laughs, and a whole lot of inspiration. So without further ado, I think it's time for us to jump in. This is not about me. It's about Shannon. Now, Shannon, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what it is that you do that um, really sets you apart from the crowd. Yeah. So my name is Shannon Tal, and I'm an experienced designer. And so I have a noble mission to make the internet a better place through user-friendly um, user and accessible websites and also taking the museum world by storm with some of the interactives that I help create for um, a lot of Victoria's biggest cultural institutions. So Melbourne Museum, the Holocaust Museum, Australian Sports Museum and zoos, things like that. Absolutely, absolutely interesting. First of all, I'd like to touch up on, you know, the whole making the websites interactive. What's wrong with the sites we have today? Well, a lot of the time they're not accessible. And so people may think that that means that they're only, you know, people think, oh, disabled people, they're not visiting my website. But in the last Australian census, one in six people identified as having a disability. And so that's a huge market that you're potentially leaving out. And there's only people that are willing to identify as that. There may be some that still need help but may not think of themselves as disabled. And so people who have colour blindness, uh, people who are use a screen reader, people who are deaf or have physical mobility challenges. A lot of the work I do enables so people can use websites um, just as anyone else would. Oh, wow. Now that really opens up um, a can of worms in and of itself, because when people go out and create websites, they just think what they see, what they like is what the, um, you know, the other people or in people that interact with the website might also like or go, you know, experience. But you're telling us that's not the case. Yeah, and it makes sense. Like we live in a very vision-centric world and use our, rely on our eyesight for almost everything. And so that's just one example. But even if you are neurodiverse, the way that things are laid out on a page, the type of typography that you use, that can all impact how you can perceive information and absorb it. And so what I like to do, and it's it's not just your website, it can be from branding and all the way to the museum work that I do. So, you know, and a lot of it doesn't just touch accessibility. So, you know, did you know that like how you would skim a page yourself and like jump around? People using screen readers also do that. And so they jump from heading to heading, button to button. And so if that's not set up properly in the back end, then it can make it really confusing and almost impossible for them to interact with your website. But the same things that make it possible for them to jump around are the same things that make your SEO work. And so a lot of the things that they have multifaceted benefits. Hmm. Now you've touched up on a subject that I, I quite like the most, which is search engine <laughs> optimization. 
I've actually gone as far as coining it simply educating others. So if you're making your website interactive, you make it easy for people to, to be educated on who you are, what it is that you do, and how they can actually benefit from your services or products that you're selling. Now, what are these elements? Because you mentioned headers and you mentioned you know aspects of the website. What are these elements that people need to really start paying attention to? Because sometimes, you know, fish don't see the water that they swim in. Yeah, so color contrast is a big one, and that's one that can impact people who you know, even have 20-20 vision. I don't need glasses myself, but if there's poor color contrast on a website or an email, that impacts how I can read it. And so an example would be if you had you know, a lighter blue on a like two similar blues with like text or you know, bright yellow on white, like these combinations are quite hard to see. And so there's actually a mathematical formula to make it uh, to determine whether it's accessible or not. And there's a few different levels. So there's uh, single A, double A, or triple A as part of the web content accessibility guidelines. And so that's a set of criteria that makes your website accessible to people with all disabilities. And so, yeah, for color contrast, it's like if it has a seven, um, yeah, you type in two hex codes and it says whether it's accessible or not. And so with all of my clients, I go through their color palettes if they have one. And then generally you can make small tweaks because they're really outrageous color combinations. You typically can tell when you're designing it, like, ah, oh, that doesn't look quite right. So normally it's just tweaks here and there, but that's a big one as well as typography size. And so whilst in a uh, criteria, there's not a set minimum, I'm always recommending my clients to do at least 16 and usually 18 pixels and above. Mm. I think what you're talking about actually requires a person to have a different mindset when it comes to giving that information because I believe our customers don't see pixels. They see love and um, you know generosity that would have been presented in the form of words put together in the form of a website. What sort of mindset shift do people need to have in order for them to no longer worry about what they think looks good, but really care about the experience that their customer is gonna be receiving? A lot of the time I'd recommend just speaking to your customers. Like I'm sure you as a marketer can also empathize and like use that strategy, but speaking with them, just getting feedback on what is working with their website and what doesn't. And so that goes past just accessibility. It goes into usability as well, because that's a lot of my career is making things intuitive and easy to understand and flow well. And yeah, just talking to your users can be really important. And if you ha do have people who identify as disabled in your orbit, then it'd be great to get their feedback. But yeah, I think that's the biggest piece of advice I can give. And yeah, before any of my websites launch for either myself doing updates on my own or for clients, I have a group of people that I can send and be like, hey, did this all look right? And I have a lot of experience in this area. And so it's easy to have blind spots. And so talking to other people can uh, uncover them and also uncover perspectives that you may not have thought of or considered so you are saying it takes a village to build a website not necessarily to build a website but to make a good one <laughs> fantastic i quite like that how did you how did you even stumble upon this is was there a personal experience that you came across or did you just get frustrated because everybody's website just didn't seem like it flowed why you? Yeah, so you know, I studied traditional graphic design for uni with a specialization in animation. And once I got into the workplace, I worked with IBM uh, during an internship. And so there was when I was doing a lot of this user experience and user interface work. So doing a lot of digital work. So helping improve the David Jones checkout flow. Also, I did the uh, Melbourne Spring Fashion Week app for that year and so doing the designs for that and so that process because in design school you get an eye for what looks good what flows well but 
I've always had an interest in psychology as well. And so bringing in that user experience element along with design and seeing how design can impact uh, choices and decisions, I really enjoyed that aspect. And so that carried a through to pretty much every job I've had during my career. And so whether I've been doing the museum stuff or the last couple of years have been very digital centric. And so creating a design system for HCF, which is a private health insurer here in Australia. And yeah, the, the subject matter, well, their business is so important. And so people who already may have poorer health, like poor eyesight, and so accessibility really played into that. And yeah, I really loved the challenges that came with it. And anything I do, I love to make user-friendly. And accessibility is just you know, quite a big part of that, but yeah, one part of an overall strategy. Absolutely, because, I mean, obviously, you know, you've mentioned some really big names. Somebody might just put that off and say, ah, maybe that's for people that have a lot of people. My customers are really good. You know, they, they're, you know, university educated, so they might not have a problem, uh, you know, facing that. What, what, what would you say to somebody who's got, um, you know, a thought line like that? Like, yeah, uh, my uh, lecturer of mine had a very good quote that good design is invisible. And so as you're going through a website, nothing should feel hard or difficult. And I'm sure you can, you and your listeners can, you know, probably think back to a time where they've been on a website or app and things just aren't working as they should. And while you may not be able to put your finger on, a lot of the times you can, but you can see, okay, if these things just changed, it would make my life so much easier. That's kind of what I do. And so you know, a lot of those platforms that you've probably had bad experiences on, they may have been big companies. Um, so companies of any size can benefit from this. And whilst I've worked with big names, I've also worked with quite small. So currently I'm working with a, uh, a very local accountant who has like a small client load, which... No, there's a lot of user experience going into his website because you no, know, the way it is currently means it's hard for people to book time with him. They're not knowing exactly who he's servicing. Things that you would you no, know, I think he works as a really good blend of marketing, psychology, and yeah, design, and that's what I really love about it. Mm, I quite like that because the brain is always trying to conserve energy and if it comes yes. through to see something that is just not aesthetically uh, uh, pleasing um, it scrolls out and goes somewhere else and that's a loss of a client and maybe if you're paying for ads that's money wasted attracting that person only to come to your website and to realize they can't they can't use any of the information that you've got on there and things of that nature but not only are you trying to make sense, um, you know, of the internet, you're also trying to make sense of our past, um, you know, in the form of museums and um, mm -hmm. things of that nature. T tell us, you know, what, what what that entails and what it is that you're doing in that realm. Yeah, so I title myself an experienced designer because experienced designer covers both the website aspect and also the museum work I do. So if you've gone into a museum, an art gallery, a zoo, and there's anything fun and interactive, like imagine tapping a wall and something happens or fiddling with a piece of machinery to get information or gaming. So I help create those experiences. And one, the most recent one that I've done was for the Holocaust Museum here in Melbourne. And so that reopened in November. So quite a new one. And the piece I did there was they had a little mock village. And so using animation, they told the stories of seven real Jewish children who were in Europe during World War II and them hiding during the war and then eventually migrating to Australia. And so they had this overarching experience and so projecting onto this mock village. But then also once that was finished, you could peer in through windows and see those particular children's stories play out like one by one and so kind of voyeuristic in a way and so I did a lot of the work in the inner windows and so animating those experiences and so we were figuring out okay what's the 
strategy of bringing children into that space because it was a children's as part of a children's gallery so everything needed to be age appropriate and you know, also make it engaging because you don't want things to feel like they're boring or dragging out too long and there was a few different things in that exhibit and so yeah figuring out a correct flow absolutely you've also done um i think some projects with the zoo the melbourne zoo yes. where there was dinosaurs in there um and yes. they sort of would come in that that was you as well right yeah, so we had an animatronic dinosaurs around the place, but then it also have a booth next to them. And so depending on what age you were, you would get yourself a lanyard. You'd be able to tap your lanyard against the booth and you would either be given a fun fact about the dinosaur that was right next to you, that's moving and growling, or if you were slightly older, you know, dinosaurs, they're a cautionary tale of uh, extinction and through meteors and so not quite sure about the climate effect on it but they wanted to educate their visitors on climate stories on animals happening right now and so if you were an older age you would get a story of an animal at the moment who's going through their own climate crisis and how that you can help prevent that absolutely i quite like it because you know if you walk into like melbourne museum there's so many things there you know there's bikes you can ride there's you know there's the running part it's all interactive and there's a thing that you can pull to see measure your strength mm -hmm. and all those things otherwise it would have just been like mm, that's nice mm, and then walk away without having actually engaged or interacted with um the environment now i'm just trying to piece everything together here shannon um could all of this have emanated because you couldn't find your way into the moss pit because part of what you were doing past was um you know taking photos of bands and um, you wanted to make sure that there was a, a good user experience when people went to go and see a band would that be your your um you know take on on the world and how it all got put together yes and no so i did photograph bands i was a photographer when i was living back in tasmania and yeah so I worked for a newspaper there and in a roundabout way, it's what got me into this because you know, through a connection, so I studied photography during high school and my old photography teacher reached out to the editor of the newspaper there. And so I did get work through the newspaper. So that was quite impressive still in high school at the time. But it was a small enough town that they wanted photos of 21sts and fundraisers like in the paper. So I was a social photographer. And so I went to these events and it really got me out of my shell and talking to people and hearing like new perspectives and all of that. And so that set me up really well for when I did move to Melbourne, studied design, you know, creative industries. And I feel like industries in general are very who you know rather what than what you know. And that was a lesson I learned very early on. And so that's kind of helped how I was able to establish a career here in Melbourne just through talking to people and some uh, practice I still keep to date. But I did really like photography. It take, taught me a lot about layout and talking to people and, yeah, also technical skills as well through, like, post-production. I decided that I wanted to uh, – uh, sorry. I <laughs> uh, Yeah, so when I moved to Melbourne – I decided that whilst I like photography, I wanted a bit more variety. And so design, because it covers so many different areas, like print, the work that I'm doing now in digital, as well as like photography as well. And so, you know, I've been referred to as a beagle designer before. Like they find it hard to focus on just one thing. And so I really like a lot of different elements. And so all through my career, you can see multiple parts and likes that I've just managed to combine into my work. And so, yeah, doing animation and the traditional graphic design, it works really well with the website work that I do, but also brings in psychology because I've had an ongoing interest in that. I've been a big museum head forever. And so another way that I've been able to combine those. And so whilst photography in a roundabout way has got me there, it, you know, it's a teach me some really great skills that have allowed me to do what I'm doing now. 
Oh, oh, absolutely. And you're in a world of your own because combining all of those, I don't think anyone else in the world has that digital, that past, that uh, current stuff that you were looking at. You know, you've got all of that uh, in leaps and bounds, but your journey to freelancing sort of began unexpectedly. Now, how did that sort of pivotal moment shape your perspective on, on entrepreneurship? Because you, you now had to go out on your own. Yeah, so I started my journey into freelancing full-time last year, back in April, and it was off the back of an unexpected layoff. Uh, last year was quite challenging for a lot of people, the design, design industry, no exception. And, yeah, I've been doing this quite a while, this being my ninth year in industry, not including my photography uh, escapades in the past. And, yeah, through that, ability to network and make things work I thought that why not back myself and yeah try it out go alone and it's worked out really really well and that variety that I really enjoy in my work I was able to make sure of because it's me that's taking on work or rejecting work and yeah I was practically fully booked last year which is quite rare for a freelancer in their first year and things are going even better this year with my first international client that's signed on that I'm doing some work with. And yeah, things are going quite well. And I'm so happy about it. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on that. It's not easy, you know, when you get started while you're working in other places, you know, you could just place a phone call and you've got that brand preceding you. But if you're showing up as a freelancer, you got to prove yourself every single moment of your existence. And one of the things that you've started doing is a web uh, audit service, a website audit service, which basically, um, you know, you're showcasing to people what their website really needs, um, you know, for them to, to have good user experience. Now, what can the people watching this expect from this and how does that sort of empower them to enhance their own online presence? Yeah, so based off my many years of experience in this area, I go through my clients' websites and just pick out opportunities and areas for improvement. And so it can be specific to the web content accessibility guidelines that I mentioned earlier. So you know, yet again, being like, oh, that color contrast isn't quite right. Perhaps tweak it to this um, through to design layouts, being like, oh, this no, it can get very, very nitpicky. And so, oh, your typography on every other page is you know, this size, but on this one page, it is a different size. Maybe change that to just contextual stuff. So a audit that I did last year, they were talking about a program in Papua New Guinea uh, that empowers female business owners, that the main photograph promoting it was of two men. <laughs> and so not the best look and so it really covers like 360 degrees so through all of that I have my own system of post-it notes so people can see exactly what area it pertains to also looking at like dev like bugs and so whether ah oh, yep that's notes regarding design or copywriting a recommendation you know, accessibility specific and yeah, it really helps my clients and I also help out with those improvements sometimes or they go off and do it themselves, but they find it really helpful. And as I mentioned earlier, it can be great to have other people look at your website because if you're building it yourself, you're so in the weeds sometimes and getting a third party impartial can really help. Oh, absolutely, because fish can't see the water that they swim in and neither can people see the air that they breathe. So it's it's one of those things. What what what's the best way that people can get a hold of you so that they can uh, maybe get this um, web audit service or maybe get started working with you? Yes, so you can look me up on shannontowell.design. The link should be in the show notes, but it's towel with two L's. Um, oh, we're gonna just spell it. <laughs> uh, so you can find me at shannontowell.design. Oh my God. You can find me at shannontow.design, S H A N N O N T O W E L L dot design. 
But if you're interested in looking at my usability checklist, there is a special link, shannontow.design slash prosperity. Absolutely. I'll definitely put that information on there so that people can actually sort of uh, get started. Okay. Now, what's really fascinating about the work that you do is museums focus on the past. You did photography of 21st birthdays and, you know, what is happening in the present and giving people socially. And, you know, you're working with websites which present an aspect that is futuristic and things of that nature. What can people expect now that you have fully combined all of these things? Um, you know, what's next for Shannon? I like to think with all of these different skills I have in my tool bag that I have all of the skills needed for any job. And so you, know, you don't use all of them for everything. And so really getting to the heart of like a problem that my client is having. And yeah, so with the accountant website, just you know, he has specific things that his website wants to cover. And so knowing exactly how to get that and finding the best solution for my clients with all of the skills and all of the network I have at my disposal. And so this year you'll be seeing more great work from me, hopefully more international work, um, particularly in the museum space. And yeah, I'm really excited about this year. Absolutely. Well, I'll be on the lookout on your website to see any new projects that you'd have worked on because obviously places like the museum, they're always changing. Uh, and if there's a new installation, it will be good to go Check it out. Well, there you have it, folks. A whirlwind of insights and a bit of inspiration, courtesy of the one and only Shannon Tower. But guess what? The fun really doesn't stop here. Now, if you're itching for more Shannon's wisdom and creativity, be sure to obviously watch this episode again, share it with a friend or two. <laughs> And subscribe to this app, um, you know, to this uh, show. And I'll also be putting the links that she gave us in the show notes below so that you can actually get started on your journey to creating very good experiences for your customers. As Shannon said, you never know who's looking at your site and who's getting bored or fatigued just by the look and feel of what it, it looks. Even though your mom, your dad says, wow, that's a good website that everybody else thinks that way so be sure to check out what um, Shannon is working on and how she can actually help you present your work in the best light using her website audit service now until next time help me thank Shannon um, you know for bringing you know uh, her energy to the show today I just want you to keep dreaming keep creating and keep prospering bye for now